Well, Dave asked me to pick up this charger, said it needed a service. You think? I should have known better. Today on Tech Garage, we're going to diagnose this knocker. Well, folks, we have a knocker here. Welcome to Tech Garage, presented by rockauto.com. Well, when an engine's knocking, that can be a real scary situation. You got a couple of options. You could put some real thick oil in it, hope it goes away and trade it in. Nah, we're not gonna do that. We're gonna diagnose it. We're gonna bring you along for the ride. Now, in order to diagnose an engine knock, you really have to decipher where it's coming from. It may be a lower end knock, it may be an upper end knock, but here's a tip for you. Camshafts move half crankshaft speed. So usually upper end knocks are single ticks and lower end knocks are those those double knocks down there when you rev it up. This one seems to be a single knock, but I got this stethoscope and I'm gonna check it out. And this is pretty cool because you look like a doctor anyway. So, and what I did is I went around and I checked it out. And what happened is it's up here, kind of on the passenger side on the top of the engine right there. You could hear it knocking up in there and it's kind of a single knock. So I believe it's coming from up there. Now, what we don't know if it's in the top timing system or it's actually an accessory because it's really up in the front end. Here's another trick for you. You can actually take the serpentine belt drive off. That's going to give you a big hand when it goes to diagnosing it. Dave, that's what we need to do. We need to take that belt off and we'll determine if it's in the front end or it's in an accessory. You got it, doctor, and I have just the tool you need. Bam. This is uh, yeah, this is the belt tool from rockauto.com and uh, we can take the belt off together. I'm going to hang this like a television show. You look very important. <laughs> But before you pull your belt off, just go on the internet and research or look at your engine. Make sure you take a picture of it, but get a belt routing diagram. Some of those could be real complex and you're not gonna know how the belt goes back on. That could be a bad thing. That could be a real bad thing. Dave, I'll reach down here and I'll pop this tensioner okay. off. We got this tool from rockauto.com. Gotta love it. Here's yeah, the small attention you need. You, you got it. Slip it right and off of there. This engine is hot because we've just been running it, so yeah, be careful. Perfect, get right. that off of there and pull it down a little right. bit. There we go. That should free us up enough here. Excellent. Uh, all right, that'll stop the accessories from pulling, I'm thinking. So Josh, if you crank it up for a second, let's see what happens. Ooh, good enough. Man, it's knocking and it's knocking bad. So that eliminated the actual accessories on the front, the alternator, all the components, but you can still hear it knocking like crazy right here. So what does that mean? Well, that means it's, looks like the upper plenum's gotta come off in the valve cover. Let's get to work. That's dirty work, not for me. Jeez, oh, of course, hard work shows up, John disappears. That's right. But like he said, let's go ahead and get in there. We gotta take this valve cover off, but to do that, we need to go ahead and get in this plenum off. We have a couple of hoses. I'm gonna get started on this air duct. All right. And if you want, just go ahead and start on these bolts. You got it, let's do it. Now we don't know what we're gonna find here because all kinds of things are going on in the front of these engines. You got chains, you got belts, tensioners, idler pulleys, and a whole lot of accessories connected to this thing. So it's gonna be a mystery until we get this apart, but John is over there with a couple different kinds of engines. He's gonna show us what we might be looking for. Well, Dave's right. There's a lot going on in the front timing system, and we'll look at it all. Let's start out with a basic timing system, a single overhead cam. Well, what's going on? You got the crankshaft located right down here, and then the crankshaft actually runs through. This one happens to be a water pump. We'll talk about that in a second. And you go up to an idler pulley, and then to the cam gear. Now I said it turns half the speed of the crank gear. You can see right here, it's twice the size. So it's gonna go a little slower. That's that single tick we're hearing. Coming over here to the idler and the tension and back around again. Now this is pretty cool because this actually has a water pump right here. And let me tell you, coolant and timing belts, well, they don't get along, they don't mix. So you're going into the whole front of the engine. You're gonna do, let's say a water pump here. You wanna go ahead and replace everything. And then to do that, you can actually get a set here. This is actually our motor over there actually has a whole set here of idler pulleys but for this one you would want to get the water pump you'd want to get the bearing the pulley the whole nine yards and go ahead and do the belt because if that belt jumps any teeth on there you're in trouble what do i mean well, let's talk a little bit about interference and non-interference engines what is that all about well an interference engine is actually going to hit the valve if we come out of time and i can show you how the timing is supposed to work it's actually a a big dance between the camshaft and the crankshaft and you can see the belt right there and as i spin it Take a look right here. You'll see what happens. As the piston starts to go down, we're gonna go into the intake stroke. 
Now the intake valve starts to open, there it goes. Now on my way back up, we're compressing the fuel, they're both closed, perfect timing. Then the spark happens, bang, I'm down on a power stroke, it starts to go down, it pushes it down, and then once again, the last stroke, I'm on my way up, the exhaust valve opens at the right time, and all the gases are expended out of the cylinder, bam, gone. Now you can see, it's a pretty cool little dance between them. Everything's happening at the right time. What happens if it doesn't go at the right time? Well, it's not pretty. Let's just say, for example, that belt breaks and that belt breaks and you're on an interference motor, whammo, you're gonna hit it every time when it comes up there. Now you could bend all the valves or you can end up with a piston looking like this. We actually got this into Tech Garage and you can see it right here. What happened is the valve actually is lodged into the piston. Pretty little indentation right there and it just sits there as pretty as can be. That's an interference engine. Now I have a couple of different engines to show you. There's actually a non-interference engine. This is the old 350s. Everybody's familiar with these. Once again, that dance, that choreographed dance between the crankshaft and the camshaft. This is an overhead valve engine. The valves are up here, there's no cams. The cam's located in the center of the block right here. So I can spin it over for you. You get the timing right, and what happens is the crankshaft's gonna spin just in the right time for the camshaft to spin, so my valves all open at the right time. Same thing, intake, bam, power, compression, boom, exhaust. Everything's happening at the right time. Now let's take a look at this guy right here. This is an actual overhead cam engine. The cam's over top, and this is a single overhead cam. So you can see here, each one of them has a single camshaft located on each top of the engine. You come through here. This one's actually not driving the water pump, but the water pump's located in here. So if it was ever Lincoln, I said it's gonna get on that belt, it's gonna jump a tooth, you're gonna have problems. You're already in there, go ahead and take care of it. Here's the crankshaft and here's the tensioner. Okay, we'll look at a couple different types of tensioners coming up. Now this one here, here's our 3.4. This is actually an overhead cam engine again, but it's a dual overhead cam. One, two, three, four. Got an intermediate shaft, pulling it around there. The tensioner's located right there. Well, that's a good look at front end configurations, but I'm curious what Dave and Josh found out on our Dodge Charger, and we'll do that right after the break. We'll be back with more Tech Garage, brought to you by rockauto.com. Tech Garage, presented by rockauto.com, is brought to you by Magic Creeper, the most versatile creeper ever. AP Laser, leading the way. And by rockauto.com, all the parts your car will ever need. Welcome back to Tech Garage presented by rockauto.com. Now we've got the valve cover off, John, and look what we found. Here is the chain tensioner and we have a flopper. Yeah, it's a flopper, all right. You know what, Dave? It sounds exactly like the noise we heard, that ticking. Yeah. There That's it is. It, number one. Number two, we could turn it over. You could actually see it, but we wouldn't want to mess up the timing or anything like that, but pretty simple repair, right? Yeah, you got it. There's a, a plate that actually holds the tensioner in there. There are two bolts that hold that plate on. All you have to do is remove those two bolts, and we want to be sure that we don't mess with the timing chain at all. We don't have to reset the timing. And if you had to, well, it would be no big deal. We actually have a graphic of this exact motor, and here's what it looks like, the actual graphic. You can see it right there. Dave's dealing with number six down there. That's the actual chain tensioner. Now, that's on that big guide that's holding that, and that's actually what's slapping around. That's the noise you're hearing. Now, what's going on there? You got seven, one, and three down there. Those are the marks, and those are the actual links on the chain. Just get that in order, you'll be in good shape. You don't want to have that thing hit any valves or have any problems. Now, when you're dealing with tensioners, there's different types of tensioners. You can see this one right here. This one, he's got a hydraulic one, but his kind of locks in a little bit different than this one. This one you'd have to push in with a vise. And when you push it in with a vise, I went to rockauto.com, I got this pin set, this little Gates pin set. This is pretty cool because you can find a pin that goes in there and locks it. I know what you're thinking. Just put a little drill bit in there and hold it. Well, they shatter sometimes and you'll have a problem. You want to make sure you do it right. Now, this is pretty cool. This is a unique one. This is a 3-4 Chevrolet GM motor. And this tensioner actually has a hole in the back. It looks just like the hydraulic one. So be careful. If you push this one with a vise, forget about it. You're going to ruin it. Now, how do you do it? Well, you can go to get a paper clip or you can use that pin set as well. There's a little hole right here in the top. I'm going to put it in there. I'm going to kind of hold tension on that. Now, if you watch this pintle right here, as I wind it in with the little screw hole in the back, watch the pintle start to go in. There it goes. Now, as it's retracting, I get to a point and it locks in right there. The paper clip locks in. Now, when I'm ready to install it in the engine, Pull it out, bam, it pops out, no problem. If you try to push it in with the vise, you're gonna have a problem. Speaking of problems, there's ours. How's ours looking, uh, it's Dave? It's not much of a problem anymore here. We'll get this out of here. 
Take a look at this one. There's not a lot you can tell visually. This is the, the cylinder when it's extended. And here's a brand new one from rockauto.com. But what happens is when you get all the sludge, this is why you want to change your oil. Because when you get all the sludge inside, it starts, for lack of a better term, makes things run wonky. So you got that chain wobbling back and forth. And what it does is it puts pressure on that cylinder over and over and over again. And it just wears it out. And that's what's happened with this one. That's exactly what's happening with this one. Well, you know what we need to do, Dave? We'll just reverse the procedure just as easy. Put that one in, unlock it, get the tension on there probably want to do an oil change as well <laughs> no doubt yeah we'll do all the <laughs> torque specifications you guys stick around you want to hear it run but don't go too far because garage ed's coming up right after this break we'll be back with more tech garage brought to you by rockauto.com Welcome back to Tech Garage, presented by rockauto.com. Well, I'm actually not a doctor, but I do play one on Tech Garage, a brake doctor that is. Welcome to the Garage Ed segment. You know what? I told you we were gonna talk about every system on this board and we we're gonna talk about it in depth. Well, we made it down to the drum brake systems. So to understand drum brake systems, let's take a look at a couple of types of drum brakes. This first one right here, this is actually a dual servo or a Bendix type brake system. What does that mean? Dual servo, two actions. That's pretty cool. You got a primary shoe right here, and then you have a secondary shoe. The vehicle direction would be in this direction here. The primary shoe is the shorter in length. You can see it's a little bit shorter than the secondary shoe. Always faces towards the front of the vehicle. Now, dual servo is pretty cool. You got a wheel cylinder, you got some springs, and you got a star adjuster on the bottom. Well, what's happening? Two motions. When your car stops, the primary shoe kind of takes a ride with the brake drum and it moves around. I can slide it over and it's going to transfer the energy through the star adjuster to the secondary shoe. Secondary shoe is going to do most of the stopping, hence the longer lining. Sometimes different coefficients of frictions, so make sure you put them on your car in the right direction. Or it may stop real good in reverse, but we want to stop in forward. Then there's the leading trailing. Now the leading trailing, a little bit different. Not dual servo, not double action. What happens here is you see the wheel cylinder and then we go through a shoe and then bam, it all stops right there at this fixed point. What's gonna happen is the wheel cylinder is gonna push the shoe out and we kind of use a wedging effect. It gets wedged in the actual brake drum itself and that does most of the stopping. This one comes back, transfers the energy back into the wheel cylinder and gets wedged on this side. So two types of drum brakes. Now a couple tips for you. Anytime you're doing drum brakes or doing a brake inspection, it's a good idea, man. RockAuto.com, I just, voila. I mean, jeez. I mean, there's a lot of parts. Tip for you, take a picture of the brakes, one side, before you start messing with the other side because you could have springs, return springs, star adjusters, you know, kinds of different e-brake adjusters, hold downs, you name it, the system may have it. I got this kit so I can replace all the springs when they start to get tempered or heat checked. You can tell when you're taking them on and off. What do I mean by taking them on and off? Well, you can take your drum off here, and if you have to, you're gonna have to replace these shoes. Like I said, take a picture of the other side so you have a reference to look at of what's going on. Now, once again, rockauto.com, they actually sell tools, all kinds of brake tools. Just go to the tool section. We got a whole kit that does discs and drum. So I can use this as a spring retractor. I can use this side to pull some springs. If I wanna adjust the star adjuster, I have everything in the set. Now, a couple tips for you. You may be going down the road and you have a disc drum system. Your pedal may be a little bit low. One or two pumps, it starts to raise up. You probably have misadjusted rear brakes. Why? Well, in a prior episode, you saw that disc brakes are self-adjusting. The fluid goes back there and it keeps the pad in contact with the rotor. Drums, not so much. And the star adjusters, well, they just don't work too great. So you want to take it apart, take some sandpaper, sand them down, clean them up real good, get that coefficient of friction, get you some brake clean, clean them off, make sure they're in really good shape. Another trick for you, you can go ahead and pry up on the brake pad. There's three raised ledges. Those are called bosses. That's actually where the shoes ride, only three places, one here, here, and down here. So I'll take a little brake lube, I'll pry it up, be sure not to get it on the shoe or the material itself, 
put a little bit in there so every time I apply the shoe brakes, they come out, the drum brakes and the shoes come out and you don't have any squealing on the backing plate itself. So you can see there's a lot of components. You can actually go and look at them right there on this graphic. Make sure you clean it, make sure you adjust it, make sure you service them. Every time you do a brake job, it's good to do a good visual inspection on the rear brakes as well. Hey, we're gonna take a short break, but make sure you come back because there's plenty more Tech Garage presented by rockauto.com. Tech Garage presented by rockauto.com is brought to you by Custom Auto Sound, the originator of classic car OEM fit radios since 1977. Alien Technologies, making today's innovations into tomorrow's technologies. And by rockauto.com, all the parts your car will ever need. Welcome back to Tech Garage, presented by rockauto.com. Well, it's been a great show so far, and we made it to the segment where it's all about the master technician's tech tip. That's right, hashtag MTTT. This time we're gonna talk about exhaust and exhaust systems. Well, why do we even have a muffler? Why do we have exhaust? Well, we obviously wanna exhaust the car, make sure that it's quiet. We wanna get the fumes out the back, but it does a couple other things too. We'll take a look at the inside in a minute, but a lot of guys write into our social media and they're asking questions about water dripping out of the tailpipe pipe and that's super interesting because cars today well they're super efficient what happens in the catalytic converter is you get HC hydrocarbon CO carbon monoxide and NOx oxides and nitrogen going in and what comes out if the catalytic converter is doing its job is water and CO2 that's right water and what happens with the water well it gets hung up in the exhaust system from the cat back so if you look right here real closely you can see a hole right here in the muffler that's actually by design that would actually drip the water out of the exhaust system and that could cause some problems in the associated hardware sometimes on the bolts a lot of exhausts today are made out of stainless steel and different alloys that can handle the water but you're getting a lot more water than usual so let's take a look inside i'm going to flip this over that's really cool in true tech garage fashion yep voila we cut one away and when we cut one away you can see inside of here what's going on you actually have your exhaust coming in and then you have a series of baffles that goes through this serves really two functions it quiets the exhaust and it creates a little bit of back pressure in the engine so when your valves open and your exhaust comes out it's not just free flowing and it also causes pulses believe it or not that actually evacuate some of the cylinders and get some of that spent fuel out so you can get more in a little bit more power and you can see here there's different welds and different channels in here any one of these can come loose Loose. probably we'll see a hammer test or tap it you can hear it rattling you could have problems internally in the muffler now back at tech garage for years I preached the big old pliers man and some oil I took some oil to take these hangers off these hangers are on the exhaust system and channel locks well friends those days are gone why man rockauto.com hooked us up with the tool of the century this thing right here pulls these hangers off and you're not going to believe this you know how you fight with these with pliers do it yourselfers and professional mechanics for years watch this voila easily just pops that thing off with no problem whatsoever goes inside of there and pops that hanger off man imagine making the job that easy once again exhaust tool they always say there's a tool for that and boy there is for that now we're talking about an exhaust inspection now when we get to an exhaust inspection it's important that you go through and you look at all the associated hardware the hangers the different gaskets the different shields everything down the exhaust and you want to get to the muffler and Josh our resident ASE master certified tech you're actually pulling an exhaust inspection you went from the front to the back looking at all the hangers the shields everything man what'd you find well, like I said, I went from the front to the back and I was just giving it a double look over because I know this is your son's car. I just want to make sure I didn't miss it in the first time. But the first time through, I was doing my hammer test, going through, tapping on everything. And the rattle, like you said, the rattle was bad. But what I found was, can you hear that difference? Big time. That's a huge, huge difference. So let's do this. Let's replace the exhaust tip. That's obviously the problem there. But let's go ahead and replace these exhaust hangers well. They deteriorate over time, and uh, it'd be a good idea to go ahead and take care of that. Now, you're ASC Master Certified. Can I use this high-tech tool? I hope you can. I'll, I don't know if you're capable. Let's try it out. Let's see. That's it. You put it in gear, you got that nasty rattle, 
awesome tech tip for this week, Josh, and I am capable. You are. And speaking of capable and able, we got Tom and Dave over the table, experts when it comes to rockauto.com. Well, at least Tom is. Well, John, if you're looking for hangers or insulators, rockauto.com is the place to start. What do you have, Tom? Uh, we have a huge selection of, of hangers. Um, it used to be in the past that mufflers and exhaust systems would only last a few years and rust out, and, and you'd get new hangers naturally when you got a new exhaust system. But now with the aluminized and stainless steel pipes, they may last for decades, and it's the hangers that we're out first. Hmm. So if you hear banging from, hey, is that a, do I need a new differential or do I need a new transmission? No, it might be a $5 exhaust hanger. That'd be really good news. <laughs> right. And you also have the tools to put them on as well. Yeah, yeah. And under Tools and Universal Parts tab, we have uh, tools for expanding pipe and fitting pipes together. And we also have, under individual vehicles, we have the hangers and we have everything from the uh, exhaust manifold up by the engine to the tailpipe in the back. Uh, so anything from stem to stern on your exhaust system and for your entire vehicle, they have it at rockauto.com. All right, the moment of truth. Josh, crank it up. Ah, that's what it's supposed to sound like, good. You know, it could be massively intimidating, that knock like that, but Dave, this was a relatively inexpensive fix. Yeah, just a little tensioner and uh, we're all set to go. We're all set to go, and you know, I got this, I don't need any more, but I do look good, I do look like a doctor. Well, you look like a dork. Well, yeah, I guess you're right, <laughs> doggone. Hey, we're out of time for today, but check with us next week. There'll be more Tech Garage brought to you by rockauto.com. Production assistance for Tech Garage is provided by Shivala College, located in Mariana, Florida. Founded in 1947, Shivala was ranked recently as one of the top three community colleges in the United States.